Hello and welcome back to the ILO's Future of Work podcast. I'm Sophie Fisher. For young people, finding that first job or starting a career after education is often a challenge, but it's a critical development moment moving from dependent childhood to adult independence. But even if you have had good, stable schooling and you live somewhere with organised systems and programmes, it's stressful. Just imagine then how much more difficult this transition is for young people who are also refugees. They may have had their education disrupted, have restrictions on their options and movement, or be dealing with the trauma of forced displacement. This is a significant issue because 54% of all refugees are under the age of 25. That's a lot of potential talent that isn't being fulfilled. Today, I'm being joined by two young people who have direct experience of this problem. Not only that, they are both involved in helping other young people find work and independence. Mashimbo Rose Nafisa's family fled the Republic of Congo in 1994 and she was born and raised in Uganda. She now lives in the Nakibali refugee settlement. Joel Amani Mafigi is also a refugee in Uganda. He was born in the Democratic Republic of Congo, but was forced by insecurity to flee in 2008. Rose and Joel, welcome, and thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you so much. Joel, can I start with you? Tell us a little bit about how old you were when you left the DRC and and what consequences that had for you in terms of education and your transition into the world of work? Thank you so much. Um, When I arrived in Uganda, I faced challenges to integrate within education. One, uh, because of language barrier. DRC is uh, a French-speaking country, so getting uh, uh, integrated into the English system was really difficult. I remember... Uh, my mother took me to school and uh, she uh, wanted me to uh, to get enrolled into a, a secondary just like I was in DRC. But uh, the head teacher told her that I could only begin from primary three. So I started from there, primary three, and I was studying as an old boy, uh, amongst uh, young, what I would call young uh, 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 students younger than me. So very difficult to integrate. Uh, when I finished uh, sec- my secondary school, I wanted to become a doctor. But when I finished my high school, I realized that actually there were a few jobs that were available for doctors in Uganda. The question I had, will I join the uh, 80% of uh, graduates who are unemployed or I should uh, take a step and uh, start uh, an enterprise uh, that would then create more jobs for for other youth. Uh, This is where I trained one of my teams, and then we started off uh, with Unleashed. Right. Okay. And Rose, uh, let me ask you, you were actually born in Uganda into a family who were refugees. What kind of education were were you able to get? What kind of skills? Um. Actually, uh, my story is a bit different from Joel's because having been born in Uganda and uh, raised in Uganda, I had chances or I had rights to education just like any other Ugandan child. I also did biology, chemistry and math with a dream of becoming a medical doctor. But unfortunately, my parents couldn't afford taking me for higher education because there are very, very limited chances of scholarship for higher education when it comes to refugees. So all that was left was to actually look at how can I use uh, the skills or the little education that I have acquired from the secondary life uh, and actually use it in the community to help people uh, use the best of it. So I, that's how I joined the Stand for Change and Unity, uh, which is a youth-led organization, a refugee-led one. And uh, in that, we do a lot of projects uh, in line with education, livelihood, social entrepreneurship. That's interesting. I mean, both of you 
clearly were pretty good academically as far as secondary school, but then were unable to to pursue your first choice of, of medical career because of, of the lack of opportunities. Joel, is that were you like Rose? Was that the source of the inspiration that um, encouraged you to to devote your career to to helping other young people actually fulfil some of the talents and dreams that they had in a way perhaps that you were frustrated? I was very much frustrated with um, uh, the lack of uh, jobs because uh, I experienced I had the first hand experience of youth who had completed even, you know, the host, uh, from the host community in Uganda who had completed their secondary uh, and they were unable to find jobs. So for me, that became the inspiration. The question now was how might we create jobs so that uh, youth can be able to create, uh, uh, can be self-reliant on themselves? Right. So now you're both involved in in a number of of different projects and programs to help young people get into into work. Um, But what do you see from your position actually at the grassroots as the greatest barriers to this? We've talked about a lack of a stable education, but is it just that or are there other things too? Joel, well, let me start with you. Personally, uh, uh, when it comes to joining uh, work and, and, and getting jobs. One of the greatest barriers that we have experienced is uh, m- uh, the mindset. And when I speak about the mindset, I, I am speaking about the resettlement mindset because most of the refugees, when uh, they come in the settlements, what they are looking at is uh, being resettled to the third country. And uh, if, if, if one is... Uh, actually looking at resettlement as the only option of hope, then it is difficult for them to integrate and create livelihood around themselves. And we are saying that, uh, at least from our point of view, that resettlement can be one part of the solution, but creation of livelihood, job, employment uh, can start from where someone is, because this is what we have also done uh, for the last six years. Right. And Rose, let me put the same question to you. Are there actually some sort of practical barriers as well that, that young people face, or is it simply simply the mindset and the lack of education? It all starts with mindset. For them, long-term projects are a no-no to them because they feel like anytime I'll be leaving. They want projects that work instantly because they feel like anytime they'll be resettled. So it's, it, it's mindset and at the same time, the lack of information. Uh, that makes or hinders young people to uh, do uh, uh, to do what they're supposed to be doing. How do you overcome that mindset um, to try and give the young people the, the attitude and the skills that might help them? Social cohesion is really, really, really very important because one of the challenges we uh, we, we had realized earlier along is that, uh, uh, for example, Congolese would buy from uh, from Congolese alone. Uh, or Rwandese buy from Rwandese alone, Somalis buy from uh, Somalis alone, which in the end does not maximize the potential, uh, but also does not bring about the aspect of innovation. So bringing in the aspect of social cohesion uh, is, uh, uh, is uh, a wake-up call to support, uh, uh, to support different nationality, nationalities within the settlement uh, cohesively and peacefully do business together Rose, would you agree with that? Yes, I agree with that, but then I would love to add something. Uh, 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 as we do all all the things that Joel is talking about, we also try to show them that the skills that they are earning here in the refugee settlement or the things that they do here are not going to stop just here. Even when they get uh, uh, a voluntary repatriation, it's the same skills that they have earned while they're in the refugee settlement that they will actually use even when they go back home. So we try to show them that the kind of life you build here or the lifestyle that you, you, you live in here is actually something that contributes to the life that you live even after the settlement. So when we do social cohesion, we make sure we group them into groups that consist of different nationalities, including even the host community, so that as they're doing things together, they are able to learn from each other and get understand that this one is doing it this way, then uh, why not me? 
And as they learn from each other, the mindset keeps on changing slowly by slowly, and we believe we'll get there. Rose, you, you mentioned that you, you bring people from the host community in. How important do you think it is to involve the host communities, Rose? I believe it's very important because, first of all, uh, uh, for the refugees to actually work very well, they need the help of the host community because uh, in most cases, if you look at the Nakiba refugee settlement, most of the uh, refugees actually earn their income from agriculture. And when, when you talk about agriculture, it means that we need pieces of land as the raw materials for the agriculture to take place. So uh, if they do not collaborate with the host community that actually has pieces of land or chunks of land that they, uh, they're not using, then it means that these refugees will actually starve because the pieces of land on which we are settled cannot be enough for us to produce uh, enough food for the refugees to, to to be sustained to sustain themselves on. Right now, both of you have worked with the ILO's Prospects uh, Project, which is um, a partnership for improving prospects for forcibly displaced persons and and host communities. Joel, I think you um, it has helped you with your organisation Unleashed, uh, which uh, helps works with refugee youth through social entrepreneurship and business development. Um, and Rose, I think you have been a trainer for for Prospects. Joe, let me start with you. Do you think that that has been helpful? Is 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 the approach correct? Yes, one hundred percent. At least from my point of view, uh, since uh, we started our engagement with the ILO prospect, uh, I can say the program has really, really been very empowering. I mean, in the past, uh, it was uh, difficult to involve with international organizations because one, they lacked trust in the refugee-led organizations. Now, having a partner like uh, ILO through the prospect program uh, work with the refugee-led uh, organization like uh, Unleashed and uh, of course Stand for Change is a very, very big milestone. And I can say uh, right now we are recognized in, in, in our communities uh, and also being trusted, not only by the local leaders, but also with the participants that we deliver these services. And Rose, ha- has it helped you with your, your work in inclusion? And also, I think you've been working with um, on entrepreneurship development with prospects. Yes, it has helped us a lot. Because first of all, the, uh, the approach to the ILO users is, is really very, I don't know, let me call it beautiful, because I feel like we are engaged in, in everything that we do. They don't just design something and throw it to us. We are engaged in the design. We are engaged in the discussions that come before projects start. And every other time we feel like something needs to change, we're always given an opportunity to raise issues and they're worked on. So uh, it has helped us earn trust, not only to local leaders, but also to other partners in the, in the country. And we are able also to get other donors or partners that are willing to work with us. And they have that trust just because they've seen us work with an international organization as we've done. Well, that's good to hear. I'm afraid we're virtually out of time. So let me just finish by asking you both um, a a short but possibly uh, tricky question. Can you each suggest one thing that could be done either by the multinational system or, or locally that would help you in your work? One extra thing. Uh, Joel, let me start with you. Yeah, uh, I, I, I really would, uh, one of the things, one of the things I would really request is, uh, uh, trust for the refugee led organizations, uh, that they are able to deliver, uh, to, uh, to also create impact within their own communities. So, uh, I'm requesting that we can have refugees on the table most often, but also discussing matters and uh, contributing to the uh, livelihood development, job creation and the education development. Yeah. Okay. That's a good practical suggestion. Rose, how about you? Yeah. My suggestion on that would be that um, if only the country would kind of help us uh, to minimize the restrictions they put when it comes to documentation 
because like for my organization, there are very many things that we would want to do out there, but you find like there's so many restrictions when it comes to documentation and all that comes because we are refugee led and uh, we don't get access to certain opportunities just because we are refugee. So if that could be worked on, then we'd be able to go. Thank you. We must leave it there, unfortunately. My thanks to Mashimbo Rose Nafisa and Joel Armani Mafigi for joining us today. And also, thanks to you, our listeners, for your time and for your attention. Please join us again soon for another Future of Work podcast. Goodbye. <laughs>